Here we go. Presidency. Is that the president's gun? Let me have it. I reached out. The bodyguard took the gun by its barrel and slammed the butt into my knuckles. A snare of pain ran up my forearm to the elbow. I reprimanded the bodyguard and disarmed him. The, the 357 Colt Python, standard issue among national figureheads, even in third world countries since the passage of the ballistic Mogadishu sanction, had been souped up over the years with a solarized ammo uplink for effect and an amplified underlug for show. The trigger, too, had been manufactured with a polysynaptic alloy that wired the user's brain to the data sphere of the gun, giving the user the option to fire without actually pulling the trigger. An entirely bourgeois feature, little more than an objet d'art to brag about like a Picasso hanging above the fireplace. I liked it. <laughs> Give it back, said the bodyguard. We're filming an infrared photo negative telekinetocolor today with an eye to a werewolf point of view. Mind the White Lodge aesthetic and remember to speak backwards in standard mirror language. As always, events occur in re ultra time. I almost said real time. I'm too used to the Keeper Sutherland thing. American 24. Yes. All of that occur in real time. Yes. I handed him the gun. <laughs> Carefully, he returned it to the velvet lined cherry wood humidor in which the president kept the weapon under supposed lock and key. Beside the humidor was a picture of the president at the grand finale of last year's storm grade mandible classic. Center stage with vein encrusted arms flexed overhead and hands crunched into opposing fists. He struck a vacuum pose that accomplished an oppressive lat spread and abdominal rumble strips while producing uncanny striations in the pectoralis minor. Hanging on the wall behind the desk was a much bigger picture of the president at the same competition, striking a different pose that foregrounded the, muscular, the muscles of the scapular region. He had come in fifth. In more than one State of the Union address, he admitted that he couldn't do better, although, of course, he had no choice but to continue to train and compete throughout his final term. The best he could hope for was that competitors with genetic advantages and more experience would sustain injuries. In his first year of office, he ordered a hit on the world champion, but Donovan Ogg's death didn't resonate with him psychologically. And since then, he treaded shallow waters when it came to bloodthirsty sportsmanship. Currently, the president stood at ease in front of the east door. His skin looked more orange than usual, set against the white rose garden through the windows. His grin made the flowers look gray by comparison. Everybody in the office expected the attack. I had been planning on it for weeks. With fluid immediacy, I removed the gun from the humidor and pistol whipped the bodyguard across the chin, once dislocating the jaw. The undercarriage hung from his skull like a wallet flap as he ogled me in dazed surprise and staggered backwards. I shot him in the forehead, and a hyperreal clump of gore exploded onto the bookshelf behind him. Proxies responded like stepped on mousetraps. I shot them at haphazard, somewhat adrenalized intervals, maneuvering the mind trigger in such a way that the bullets came out 50, 60 at a time and nearly vaporized their targets, fabric, flesh, and all. I saved the last round for the president. You misunderestimate me, he decreed, eyeballing me with law and <laughs> I shot him at the jet. His pectoral sagged and seemed to draw him to his knees, shattering the caps, and the bullet hole screamed like a wraith. He tried to say something to me, then fell sideways into the hardwood floor as if knocked over by a rubber mallet. The red phone rang. I wiped my fingerprints from the gun with my tie, returned it to the humidor, and picked up the receiver. Mr. President, said a voice. Uh, this is me, I replied. You have been nominated for an Academy Award. Congratulations. Thank you. This is a surprise. I wasn't in any movies this year. <laughs> not, I have never been in a movie, let alone starred in one. I only exist in reality. Nevertheless, the voice rejoined, somebody will be over shortly to collect you. I laid the receiver on the desk. I unmanned the receivers for the black and yellow phones. There was a collective disharmony followed by a numb flatline. A poorly shaved Arab wearing a kofia and a garish identity suit ushered me from the Oval Office to Gold's Gym. He promised to have me back before the arrival of the awards committee. On the way there, he assured me that the phone call had been a purposeful fiction. At the gym, the overt reversion to the golden age of bodybuilding offset me. The equipment was ancient and limited, limited mainly to kettlebells, dumbbells, barbells, no machines. Mirrors were scant and reflected images without bias or augmentation. 
This had to do with the lighting, too. Even the bodybuilders lacked the definition and bulk of modern politicians. It was as if I had been forced through the blowhole of a time warp. Gripping 50-pound dumbbells, I found an empty bench, sat on the end of it, and did a set of speedy alternating curls to failure. I was able to do more reps with my left arm despite being right-handed. I attributed the anomaly to a stigmatism I incurred as a child. The subsequent pump in my biceps reminded me that everybody, if only for a moment, can claim the throne of God. A black and white television that would have passed for a big screen in the 70s sat on a fold-out table in the corner. An extended commercial, or an abbreviated sitcom, called Chip Calories played over and over. A bronze-haired ad man with a mild case of craniodiaphysial dysplasia and spray paint assisted abs explained that some foods function as sheer fuel for the body, whereas other foods amounted to dead weight. He emphasized the raging idiocy of non-fat phrases and the revenues gleaned from the healthy fats found in nuts, hummus, salmon, avocados, and various oils. <laughs> Protein was equally equally important. Fuck carbs. <laughs> <laughs> Extracted from vegetables, small quantities of sweet potatoes, and minuscule quantities of brown rice. He concluded, look, it's not hard, you fucking dumbasses. Anybody can look like me. He stepped back from the camera and bathed in a shower of anabolic rays that enhanced the prowess of his musculature. He put his hand, pump iron like a man, and you'll get results. Inhale another candy bar and scarf, scarf down another bucket of fried chicken, and you're nothing but a shit eater. That's shit food, shitheads. Seriously, not hard. Eat good and exercise and don't be a fucking asshole. <laughs> okay. Before relooping, the ad man placed a gun beneath his chin. Golden trigger. Some of the golden age bodybuilders found inspiration in the ad man's coda, enthusiastically grunting through additional reps, whereas others ignored the TV or stared at it like an alien artifact, uncertain of its capabilities and inborn modus operandi. <laughs> Eventually, an assassin moved across the cracked rubber floor of the gym, handgun pointed at me from an elongated straight arm. He didn't fire, and he didn't run. He walked briskly and assertively, taking long, even strides, and he stared at me with a boxer's fanatic eyes. Reality converged on his approach from multiple angles, moving between close-ups of his face, the gun, and his powerful legs, and spinning around his body obsessively as if to etch reality into an ontology of mourning. <laughs> wine, sip of wine. <laughs> For the two minute report, the Arab smashed a 25 pound plate into the assassin's face. The gun flew from his grasp, and his feet kicked out in front of him, and he went down hard. A bouquet of blood erupted from the broken gash of his mouth as his head struck the floor. It hung in the air for a moment, a liquid rose. Then spread apart like buckshot and splattered a nearby bodybuilder from Trapezius to Peronius, super stylizing the appearance of his grooves better than most affordable tanning sprays. 